Uh, it is my sincere pleasure to introduce uh, Seth Castile. As I told him, I think his title on the internet goes as a award-winning photographer and New York Times best-selling author. So that's what I chose to introduce him as. But in all seriousness, uh, Seth's work is extremely well known. I think we've all seen it a lot. Uh, books, magazines, newspapers, everywhere. And he's just coming out with a new book, Underwater Puppies, so no better time to uh, hear from him. So without further ado, I'm going to let him uh, tell you guys about all of this. Thank you. Thank you for the nice intro. Well, thanks everybody for having me come out here today. First time I've ever been to the Google campus. Real excited about it. Had lunch over here. Met some really cool dogs. Real happy to learn that obviously lots of dog people here. And lots of dogs on campus and coming to work. Uh, I mean, I, I have that kind of job too, so that's cool. But it's always nice to meet other folks that can bring dogs to work. So pretty cool deal. Uh, so my name's Seth. This is my latest project, Underwater Puppies. This is um, important for a lot of reasons. We're going to get into that in a minute. But first, I want to talk about cats. <laughs> so a little bit about me. I'll probably speak for about, I don't know, I, I want to say 30 minutes. If I see people sneaking out or yawning or throwing things at me, I might shorten it. Uh, but sometimes, if you give me a microphone, even this microphone, I'll have a tendency to ramble on a little bit. Also, while I'm speaking, if you guys have any questions about anything, it could be relevant or not, feel free to raise your hand, ask me, and I'll do my best to answer your question. Uh, how many dog people are out there? How many people like dogs? Oh, good, because if you didn't raise your hand, I was going to ask you to leave. <laughs> uh, how many people have dogs? Oh, quite a few. Terrific. Any, any good swimming dogs out there? Who has swimming dogs? Cool, we'll talk later. <laughs> so I'm originally from the state of Illinois. Uh, moved out to California to go to film school in 1999. Went to film school, thought I was going to be a movie director, movie producer, that kind of thing. Um, got a job at Sony Pictures Entertainment right out of film school, working as an assistant and then working in finance. Uh, having no experience in finance, I found myself in a position with some responsibility and then people always wonder, geez, what happened to Sony? You know, maybe, they hired, maybe they hired people. I can't believe I'm saying this and we're taping this, but that's OK. Uh, <laughs> I'll also try not to swear, because this is going to be on the internet someplace. Uh, but anyways, worked in finance and somehow made the transition over to advertising for Columbia Pictures. So I was working on advertising campaigns for all of Columbia's big films, Spider-Man, Angels and Demons, um, The Da Vinci Code, two James Bond films, Casino Royale, Quantum of Solace, and dozens of other movies. Really, really fun job. And because I worked at Sony, I met these baby cats. So this is how it all began for me back in 2007. Uh, I had a friend who will remain anonymous, uh, because maybe she'll see this, but she'll know who she is. Her name is blank. <laughs> uh, wonderful lady, and she is an animal welfare person. She cares about animals more than she cares about people. And she is the person that you go to when you, when you find a cat that needs some help. She won't tell you no. Her heart is definitely bigger than the logic of her mind. So, uh, and I applaud her for that. Really sweet lady. So, and I'll give you an example. At one point, when I first met her, she was also working at Sony with me. She had about five cats. And then time went by, and then she had about 60 cats. And I said, you know, hey, I don't know a lot about cats. But I feel like that's at least five too many cats. <laughs> so anyways, uh, she and some of her friends were taking care of this cat colony living on the Sony Pictures lot. And they basically just lived on the lot. They would make sure the cats are fed, taken care of. Uh, if they have any new additions to the cat colony, they would trap the cats. They would spay or neuter and put them back into the studio wild. They had it pretty good, the cats did. I mean, I watched Brad Pitt pet some cats out there at one point. Um, and they're just Cats are just roaming around. And of course, it was so good for the cats. Life was good. The cats got on the phone. They called all their friends, and everybody was just coming in. So of course, what happens? You get baby cats. So my friend uh, found these cats, and she said, oh, no, Seth, you know, there's more, more cats. And I'm thinking, oh, my gosh. So I was getting into photography a little bit at the time. I just got a Canon Rebel XT and a Sigma 24 to 70 lens, not knowing a whole lot about photography or cats. Uh, I just said, you know what? why don't we use this Sony email network we have set up? We can just blast out an email to everybody at Sony. We'll sneak these kittens in to an executive's office down the way. We'll take some pictures of them. And uh, we'll put them out there on the Sony email network. Now, you're not really supposed to use a network for that kind of thing. <laughs> 
But I'm like, well, what are they going to do? Are they going to fire us for trying to help homeless kittens? I'm like, that's a great PR line right there. Sony <laughs> fires Sony fires employees for helping homeless kittens. <laughs> so, anyways, that's what we did. We took these snapshots. Uh, my favorite's right here, the little claw on the on the couch. Just leaving a little mark here, but. Took these shots, put them, uh, put them out on the network, and 24 hours later, all the kittens were adopted. That's pretty cool. So then, a couple weeks later, guess what? More baby cats, the fire engine kittens. We found these kittens in a fire engine trying to stay warm, and they were literally in a fire engine near the engine, and they were just trying to stay warm in there. So did it again, took some more pictures. They all got adopted. And I'm like, wow, this is pretty cool. So I started volunteering at the West LA Animal Shelter. I said, you guys need any help with photography? You know, I've been photographing these little baby cats, and they got adopted. Uh, do you need any help? And they said, yeah, come on in. So I started volunteering to take better adoption photos to help find specific homes for dogs and cats at the shelter. And that was back in 2007. So I'll do a little slideshow, just kind of the, the process and how this all kind of came to be for me. Um, and these are taken over the last several years in different shelters around the country. But I'm going to show you typical intake shots and then the more positive adoption photo. So this is sort of a typical intake shot that you're going to find. As of a few years ago at an animal shelter, not exactly a great marketing tool for a little Gloria here. You know, you see this, and, and generally, you're going to be a little bit terrified. Uh, some people would argue, oh, there's a sympathy card here. You're, you're concerned, so you're going to go in to the, to the rescue, and you're going to save Gloria. And that's true a tiny bit. But mostly what happens is people are afraid. People see this and they think, I could never go in there. What am I going to see? What kind of experience am I going to have? I could never bring my kids in there. And it turns people off. And I, I'm happy to say this, even though it's been recorded. Uh, there's a campaign out there you may have seen on TV. And the shout outs to Sarah McLachlan. Images, Sarah McLachlan music. Has anybody seen the commercials? I've seen the South Park version. OK. <laughs> and how many people turn the channel, change the channel when they see that? It's negative, right? It's a negative thing, and people just think, oh, they hear the music now. Anytime that song comes on, you're just like, oh my god. Now, in all fairness, it is the ASPCA. I'm happy to talk about them. They're friends of mine, love what they do. They're making a huge difference overall. But I have to argue, is that campaign really effective? Now, it's not an adoption campaign. It's a fundraising campaign. It's been extremely successful for the ASPCA. But I argue. And I'm still looking for my meeting with the president of the ASPCA. So ASPCA, if you're out there on camera, um, call me. Let's have a meeting. And hopefully it will be productive, and I can help you guys out. But I have to argue, at what cost is that campaign causing the entire effort? So yeah, they're raising money, but they're scaring people away. So many people see the commercials, and they just, they're terrified. They won't go into the shelter. And it's done a lot of damage, I think, for the image of rescue and adoption. So the point of doing this is, even though this is stretched out, this is this is uh, it's kind of against that campaign. So this is trying to inspire people to be a part of the cause, inspire people to come in, say hello, embrace the animal shelter or your local rescue, and volunteer, adopt a new little friend, uh, rather than change the channel. You know what I mean? So this is kind of what we're doing. And these are just, I'll do a little slideshow here uh, and kind of show you what we're up to. Olive. <laughs> and these are, you know, when these, um, when these dogs and cats come into the animal shelter, I'll show you. Look at Chuck's. <laughs> they look so funny because they're stretched out here a little bit. But uh, So when they come in, I mean, they're coming in in all hours of the day, all hours of the night, from a variety of circumstances, most of which are not positive. And you can only imagine what Ruben's thinking here. Like, what is going on right now? So I do like the bandana. I think that's a plus. But overall, just not a very productive marketing shot for Ruben here. And this is in Chicago, taken uh, in 2011. And this is probably sometime in the evening. You know, you have, you have the lead, which is a chain, which is terrible. You have the ominous boots and the legs over here. And this is just not a really good shot. So, but unfortunately, you know, when Ruben comes in, an ID shot's taken. So it's basically just to keep track who's who. And the ID shots oftentimes are what is used to find a home for that pet. Um, it's just not the best opportunity at, the, at that time to take a picture. And it's no fault of the shelter staff, most of these people. So public shelters have really no money. They, have, they always struggle to find support. They have not enough staff. They have not enough of anything. So they're just struggling to try to you know, do the best they possibly can. They don't have proper photography equipment. So this is kind of what you're going to get. So I can't really blame the people. It's just a situation. Um, here we go. This is, I think this is better. <laughs> uh, but what we're finding is people are actually printing these images out. They see them online. They bring them in, and they want to meet Ruben, or they want to meet 
you know, this little men pin right here. It's kind of funny. <laughs> it just it cracks me up that it's stretched out, but it's funny. Um, Bailey's is also in Chicago, and this is the real intake shot for Bailey. And this is probably some time back in 2010 or 11. Again, you wouldn't really even know what Bailey looks like here. And you have, you have this. I think it looks a little better anyways. Wilma, this is also in Chicago. When I started volunteering in Chicago, so basically I went from West LA to South LA, started traveling around to different cities, just volunteering at animal shelters all over the place. And then I started my own charity called Second Chance Photos, just teaching workshops to people who are interested about how to take better adoption photos. So that's kind of what you're seeing here. These are taken in cities all over the country. I then started teaching workshops in other countries, in Europe and also in Australia, and learned a lot about about uh, what is effective for these guys. Wilma, I mean, I think this is just this night and day right here. I mean, look at the difference here. All these dogs got adopted, which is pretty cool. And you wouldn't really even know what Blake looks like here. Yeah, this. <laughs> <laughs> now, this is a little smoke and mirrors because one of, my, one of my secrets that I'll do is if the dog is allowed to have treats and is behaving a little bit, then I'll let the dog chew a treat while I'm taking the picture. And you're seeing that here. It also works good for people. <laughs> This guy's having a snack back here right now. You can take a shot of him. Probably be pretty good. <laughs> um, so then kind of fast forward. So I was working at Sony. I went over to Disney. Oh, this is interesting because this is, is going to be available for people to download. Got fired from Disney Studios. I did get fired. I walked in, got fired for no good reason. However, I still love D Disney. I love Disney. I always have. I love the message. It was a dream to go work for Walt Disney Studios. Uh, Walt Disney has always been one of my heroes and still love the company. Came in one day, been working 90, 100 hours a week, working my tail off. I didn't get laid off. I got fired for reasons completely beyond my control uh, that I didn't think were fair. But I decided that I would rather work with dogs and cats. <laughs> so um, walked in one day and they said, you know, you're out of here. And didn't burn a bridge, but I decided to spend my time with dogs and cats. I'd already been developing my craft as a photographer. I've been doing the volunteer thing. I've been doing a little bit of uh, kind of commissions on the weekend. People would say, can I, hire, you know, can I hire you to photograph my dog? So basically, when that fateful day happened in 2009 at Disney Studios, it was ultimately a good day for me. I mean, that changed my life. If that didn't happen, I would have never been doing any of these projects. And I would still, I don't know what I would be doing now. Who knows? Um, but so I really, you know, I really am glad that happened. At the time, it seemed kind of dramatic. Uh, but it did give me the opportunity to go pursue what I really loved, and that's working with animals. So went off, did that full time. Things weren't going that well. Was struggling to find enough work to really make ends meet, pay for my rent, pay for the car, pay for health insurance now, pay for a hot date every once in a while. <laughs> that was adding up. Um, so I couldn't really afford living in Los Angeles, and I had kind of a, a ticking clock. I mean, I was going to run out. I had about $50,000 in debt already on the credit card. My cash flow was very limited. My parents were like, oh, how's it going out there? I'm like, it's going great. They, don't, they, didn't, they didn't know. So I struck a deal with a company called Groupon. Everybody know Groupon? Struck a deal with Groupon. I was pretty excited about that. They approached me to do a deal uh, for a pet photography shoot. Now. It seemed also at the time that Groupon was approaching everybody to do anything. So if you would do a deal with Groupon, <laughs> so I guess it wasn't that flattering, but I just thought, you know what? I got to stay busy. I got to find opportunities. I got to work. I want I wanted to just work on my craft. And I thought, let's do it. For $59, you could hire me. I would come out to your home or a location of your choosing to do a 30-minute photo shoot. You also get two 8x10 prints. And I made about $29 out of that deal. So I made about half. A little less than half. So when I was, <laughs> it was supposed to be a 10 mile radius of my home is where the, the shoots could take place. Now I'm more like 150 miles. <laughs> so <laughs> people were booking me in Santa Barbara. People were booking me in San Diego. So I was, I don't know. I mean, I was like, well, I got to do it. So I was driving all over the place and I was doing the math, trying to be a business owner, looking at the, the math of it. And I'm like, well, I'm definitely not making any money. How much, am I, how much am I losing? Because when you're driving to Santa Barbara and back, I mean, just do the math on the gas alone. I mean, you're, you're not coming out ahead for 29 bucks, that's for sure. 30 minute shoot would extend to an hour, an hour and a half, two hours, sometimes even longer. And then all the time I'm spending on editing and everything else, so it was really an epic fail for me to do the Groupon shoot, except for this little character right here. 
He's a knight in shining armor. This is Buster, the Cavalier King Trail Spaniel. Show up at his house in 2010 at a Groupon photo shoot, and he decided he would rather be in the pool than on land. Uh, this is a shot. I did this interview with NBC Nightly News with Brian Williams a couple weeks ago, and they asked me, do you have any original shots of Buster from when you first met him? So I looked back at an old hard drive. I haven't seen these in years now. I just haven't thought about it. And I came across these. This is now one of my favorite shots I think I've ever taken, because this is right before everything began for me. I uh, didn't know it at the time. You can already see he's wet here. So he's already been in probably once. And now he's looking at us again saying, in the background, I have Jane, who's Buster's human. You better not do that. And he's thinking, oh yeah, I'm going in. <laughs> so of course, he went in over and over again. She wasn't happy about it, because she wanted some beautiful dry land shots of Buster with his hair blowing in the breeze. Uh, I said, wait a second, maybe there's something to this. I left, bought the little point and shoot underwater camera. Uh, it was a Sony, I think a TX5. Came back and started doing these kind of shots, knowing really nothing about underwater photography, nothing about this camera. I wasn't even sure if I was taking pictures. It was kind of confusing. <laughs> but you can, you can see him in the background. And then you have, this is one of the first, this is kind of the transition. He's going in. Uh, and then you have that. <laughs> And so this is the very first underwater dog shot that I, that I took. And this is back in 2010. Didn't know I had this. I got home and saw it. And it's just like, wait a second. This is unbelievable. I was so excited about it. So of course, I sent this to Jane, my friend Jane. I said, oh my god, Jane, you, know, you have to see what, what Buster looks like underwater. And she said, yeah, yeah, but we didn't get the dry shots. You, know, you got to come back down here and get this. So I went back down. <laughs> I drove back down, because we didn't get the dry shots, did the dry shots. <laughs> yeah, back and forth. <laughs> Who knows how much money I lost initially on that shoot, but as it turns out, it was a good idea anyway. Um, so went back, did this, and then was just getting really curious about the underwater thing. So I started doing more shots of, of Buster, <laughs> playing around with different types of underwater camera gear, underwater camera bags I tried out, different types of casings. I rented a dive housing one time for $500 for the weekend, and it broke. And uh, Oh, it was, it was tough. But it, just interested in learning about underwater photography and also just fascinated with dogs and their connection to the water. And so I was just doing these various types of lighting. Really no idea what I'm doing, but Buster here, he, he kind of helped me figure it all out. Did this, which is now a tattoo on my arm, which you can see. Oh, that's me underwater here. But you have uh, this picture now is actually right here on my arm. Look how noble Buster looks here. <laughs> <laughs> He's just so proud, you know? Uh, but yeah, so this shot is actually one of, my, one of my favorite shots. And this was a, a picture I did with an underwater camera bag, as it turns out. Put it on a hard drive. I mean, I was taking all kinds of pictures. Didn't really know what I was looking for. Put it on a hard drive. Didn't even realize I had this shot until about a year later. I went back through and found it. And now it's on my arm forever. People say, wow, you have somebody else's dog tattooed on your arm. <laughs> uh, but this is the guy that changed my life forever. And if I could buy him a beer, I would. But he has unlimited dog treats for me for the rest of eternity. So, But here's a little selfie we did. Um, I don't know who got the ball on this take, but <laughs> I look like I might have got it. Or I might, I might have uh, got part of his mouth in my foot, too. It's hard to say. OK, there's us. And then after working with Buster, I was like, who else likes to swim? As it turns out, a lot of dogs like to swim, and they have a connection with the water that goes back almost 20,000 years. So started working with all these guys, all kinds of different types of dogs, and just doing fun photo shoots, just for fun, not making any money on it. I invested the last few thousand dollars I had available on a credit card in a surf housing, which is an underwater housing designed for surf photographers and surfers. So I bought this. It's from SPL Water Housings. And mostly I bought it because it was more affordable than a dive housing. And I liked that uh, it was bright yellow. I thought that could come into play. And I liked that I didn't have to buy additional lighting. I could just put my flash on top of it. So I created the original series with this housing in a Canon 7D with a Tokina 10-17 to fisheye lens. And made these shots uh, really just for fun. See all these clowns and all kinds of different dogs. This is a Cocker Spaniel here. This is a, uh, a Jack Russell Terrier. This shot ended up in National Geographic magazine, Visions of Earth, back in August of 2012. That's, that's a dream come true right there. Uh, this shot right here, this is a shot that really took my photography from nobody knew about me to everybody knows about underwater dogs. This happened on February 9th of 2012, and have a couple people to thank, including Reddit and Google. So thanks, Google. 
A lot of people don't know that, but uh, the images became, this image became a top thread on Reddit. Uh, and then it moved through Google+, Plus. it moved through all kinds of different social media platforms. We tried to track exactly what all, and it was just a frenzy of action. But it happened overnight, and then no one exactly knows how many tens of millions of people saw the shots overnight, but it was, it was out of control. My website was crashed, my website was on a shared server with GoDaddy, with limited bandwidth, and it was, it was just down. But I like to think, you know, what you can't have, you want more, so people are trying to get on my site. Oh my, I can't get on the site, so. <laughs> Funny little game. Um, but yeah, so this is a shot that, that kind of went viral on, on February 9th of, well, it didn't kind of go viral, it went viral. No idea that could even happen, and my life has never been the same since then. So out of control. Um, here's the first book, Underwater Dogs. So basically when the images went viral, one went viral, then people started picking up the rest of them, and it just made a whole round. And I'm talking about a global, a global round, I mean everywhere, all over the place. The inquiries I was getting, I was getting 10,000 emails a day. Um, don't know how that happened. I mean, I was getting, I was tracking traffic on my website at 150,000, and that was, my website was crashed most of the time, you know, and I was still getting that many emails. It was, I, I, just, I didn't have an assistant. <laughs> I was trying to figure out which emails were important. The next morning, I was on the phone with CNN World Report. On the other line was Good Morning America, and I was trying to figure out who's more important. <laughs> uh, so I could get into this for a little while, but basically, as a photographer, you always hope to make a living, maybe, as a photographer. I mean, I certainly was trying to make a living. That was my career. And I'm like, wow, I've been handed an opportunity. I've got to seize the moment here. You know, I found my underwater dog. Now I've had this opportunity. Seize the moment. Make the most of it. And so I just went after it. I did all kinds of interviews. I fielded inquiries from literary agents knowing nothing about publishing. I selected a book agent named Michelle Tesler, based out of New York. Didn't know if that was the right choice. She liked dogs. I like dogs. <laughs> So we teamed up, made a book proposal. The book went to auction. Uh, all the major publishers and a bunch of other publishers bid on the rights to sell the book. I'm on the phone one day with Random House and Simon Schuster and HarperCollins and Chronicle. And I really don't even know what was going on. It was a really good problem to have. Um, but everybody bid on the book. It went to three rounds. Little Brown, Random House, and Simon Schuster were the final three bidders. And I ended up choosing Little Brown and turning down Random House. I'm sorry, Random House. I like you, but it just didn't work out. Uh, Little Brown's been wonderful, really happy to work with them, also big dog people. So went out, shot the book in 60 days, all around the country, 300 dogs, published the book October 2012. Uh, the initial print run was extremely limited. The book was sold out for almost a month around the holidays, even though it was one of a Oprah's favorite books of the year. You couldn't buy it almost anywhere. Uh, but it was still New York Times bestseller for 11 weeks, the best-selling photography book of the year, one of the best-selling photography books ever made with over half a million copies in print right now, 13 editions around the world. And it's just dogs jumping into swimming pools. <laughs> Pretty crazy. Um, but anyways, just f phenomenal for me. And I, you know, I uh, have to pinch myself every day because what's happened. So we made a kid's book too. Some of the adults thought the images were too uh, primal or too scary for the kids, which was weird because all the kids I was hanging out with, they thought the shots were hilarious. Or we made a kid's book for adults. <laughs> and included a free poster for them. <laughs> There's some fun rhymes in here. I'm not much of a writer. I'm technically an author, but I'm not much of a writer. I, don't, I wouldn't consider myself a very good writer. But I did get to write some fun rhymes in here. Little Brown said, hey, you know, we're, we're going to hire somebody to write your book. I'm like, I, what, I can't do it? So I'm like, so I wrote some fun rhymes. I don't know if they're good, but I think they're appropriate. And that was a lot of fun. Uh, also, some of the kids were ripping the pages out of the books. They were so excited, apparently. <laughs> or they're just kids. So we made board books. Those were published uh, a few months back. And so we have colors and numbers. If you're learning to count to 10, I recommend the book on the right. <laughs> <laughs> Puppies. After Underwater Dogs happened, we thought, all right, what's, what's going to happen next? Underwater Cats. The natural, <laughs> the natural choice. I bought the website, underwatercats.com. If you go there, you will find approximately zero pictures. <laughs> but I thought one day, if the world's upside down, dogs are cats and cats are dogs, at least I'll be ready for that. Uh, I have been swimming with some cats. They choose to get in. Turkish fans, Maine Coons, Bengals, some other exotic mixes do have a history with the water and appreciation for the water. And they get in and swim. Now, it's not every cat uh, within those breeds, but certainly you will find some swimming cats out there. But not diving in, and not the same relationship that we'd find with dogs. 
So that book's on hold <laughs> indefinitely. Now, I have been swimming with some exotic cats. I've been in the water with tigers as well as bobcats. Uh, and you could make a series. And I've done some shots. You could make a series about that. I don't think you could do a full book. And then it's also not domestic cats. So you know, most of us wouldn't have a relationship with a tiger or a bobcat. Um, but many of us, of course, do have relationships with domestic cats. So maybe one day. Puppies. In underwater dogs, you'll find a couple of puppies, one of which is 12 weeks. The other is six months. I thought, well, can I make, can I make a whole book with puppies? It would be fun, but I don't know if I can. So I started just exploring the idea of working with puppies to find out if it was even possible and how I felt about it. And what I found was not only could I make it, but it needed to be made for two very important reasons. And the first is the most critical reason. It's water safety for pets. So every year, uh, it's estimated between seven and 10,000 dogs drown in swimming pools in the United States. That's a lot of dogs. Now, there's millions of dogs, 10, seven to 10,000. That's a lot of dogs. It's a shocking number. And I hate to say that. This is a very joyful project. But the sense of urgency about water safety is very, very high. And it's not because people don't like their dogs. It's not, be, you know, people just don't understand the dangers of a swimming pool, especially in states like California, Arizona, Texas, Florida. I mean, neighborhoods, you'll find pools at every single home. And pools are on the rise. More and more pools every year. The weather seems to be getting hotter everywhere. More and more pools are happening. More and more danger. Now, pools can be a lot of fun for all of us, but they're also a major, major danger for pets and human children as well. But people don't think about that. I ask folks, I'm like, would you leave your 18-month-old human baby unattended in your backyard next to your pool while you're away at work? No, I would never do that. But the same people would potentially leave their dog there who's never been in the pool before and has no proper experience in understanding what it is or how to get out. So all puppies know how to swim when they're three or four weeks old. You put them into the water or even above the water, and they start to check things out. It's an instinct. It's hardwired in. They know how to do it. It's a doggy paddle, and they start off slow. And then they'll go faster. And you put them in. Most of them are buoyant little things. And they'll just do, 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 do. And they're, they're terrific. Um, but they need to practice. They need to practice. They need to build confidence. And most importantly, they need to understand how to get out of a swimming pool. And that's the number one thing. That's the number one thing that we have to make sure we get across is because your dog falls into the pool, they're going to make an effort to swim. They're going to make an effort to try to get out. But it's not a natural body of water. So there's a disconnect. If, you, if you're in a lake, if you're in a stream, a river, the ocean, anything that's natural, chances are you're going to have multiple options how to get out because there's going to be some kind of a natural gradient or natural way to find yourself out. A lot of pools these days still just have ladders or would just have one exit, which is stairs, and it may not be accommodating at all for a dog. Most dogs that drown, drown two feet away from the exit. They just swim around in circles, and they don't know. It's terrible. They're not great climbers, so they can't pull themselves out. It happens all the time. It's not, you know, it's not because people are... They're not deliberately trying to set their pet up for disaster, but it's happening. So there's a lot of other things going on with swimming pools in terms of safety, limiting access, fences, alarms, a lot of things that should be happening, but also preparing your pet to be safe is the number one thing. That number should not be between seven and 10,000. I mean, that's just ridiculous, if you ask me. So that's what this book promotes. It's promoting water safety for pets. You know, um, if, I can, if I can improve that number even just a little bit, and I sell no books, that's fine with me. You know, I just want to get the message out there. So that's the number one thing. Number two thing is rescue and adoption. That's how I got started. Most of the puppies you'll find in here are rescue puppies and have since been adopted. I finished the book about a year ago. Um, and just as a reminder to folks that you, know, you can find wonderful pets um, at your local animal shelter. And I think so many people just don't realize that. I was talking to a friend of mine uh, pretty recently, and he has a, a puppy enrolled in a puppy training class. And, you know, it's the only rescue puppy out of 12 or 13 in there. And you're thinking, why is that? You know, why is it happening? I don't criticize people for buying dogs, but I do suggest to people to consider rescuing a pet because I think it's a terrific option. Most people just don't understand. You can get a great, great dog, a great cat. Uh, they're not broken. You know, they're not, they're not having problems. Like, they are terrific pets. Um, you just got to go in and do it. That's it. And you can find purebred dogs. You can find mixed breed dogs. You can find puppies. I mean, I've seen it all. And I will tell you, no matter what you want to find, you can find it through a shelter or rescue. It might take you a couple extra minutes to do the research, but you can find it. So I thought it was cool to kind of feature some of these guys as my little rescue puppy ambassadors. <laughs> um, these are, this is in Chicago. Um, so I worked with about 1,500 puppies on this project, mostly just as a swim teacher. 
and occasionally as a photographer. Most of the puppies came out, they got initial lessons to understand their physicality in the water, buoyancy, and start to condition them to look for the exit and find their way out. Out of 1,500, you'll find just 72 in the book, 105 pictures. Most of the puppies didn't get pictures at all. They just swim A to B a couple times and they go home. Um, some of the puppies obviously decided that they do enjoy themselves here and they were very curious and became playful and would jump in either at me, with me, or chase toys. So those are the puppies you'll find in the book. And it was kind of my job once I'd figure out, okay, who's, who's dominating right now? Who's ready to play? And then I'd just grab my camera and do some shots. But some photo shoot events in Chicago, I had one. We had 30 puppies come out, zero pictures in the book out of 30 puppies. Spent all day, flew in. My gear didn't arrive. Had to have my backup gear flown in overnight for $400. Weeks of planning, not a single book shot. Everybody got a lesson. Uh, but then this particular day, I mean, we had this shot. We had this shot. We probably had 15 book shots. And so you never really know when it's going to happen. So it's kind of cool. But this was maybe going to be the book cover. Um, but we thought maybe it's a little too sassy to be the book cover. This is Ginger, all grown up now. Saw her the other day. She's a wonderful swimmer and looks almost the same, same markings. It's a little bit older. Uh, this is Raleigh. This is in Tucson, Arizona. Quick note about this. So this is an outdoor pool. I work with outdoor pools and indoor pools for this. Water temperature was very important. Between 80 and 92 degrees is where I like to have the water for the puppies and for myself. <laughs> but mostly for the puppies, we wouldn't teach our human children to swim in 40 degree water. I hope not. Um, so these guys, you want to make them feel comfortable. You don't want to shock them by putting them in water that's too cold. This water actually... <laughs> is in Tucson, and I, I knew it was cold at night in Tucson. So I called the pool owner, and I'm like, hey, man, it's been getting kind of cold there. Like, how's the water? He's like, it's kind of cold. Do you have a heater? Yeah, turn it on. OK. Turns on the heater. I arrive the next day. It's 100 degrees out. The heater's still on, and the bubble tarp is on top of it. Uh, we peel it back, 107 degrees. <laughs> I know. So we went to the refrigerator. We got a bunch of ice cubes, you know, <laughs> throwing them in. You got to try something. So we got it down to 102 by the time the puppies arrived. And we had the opposite problem. The puppies could only be in for a couple minutes because it's just too hot for them. So, but we were able to get a couple of really cool shots. These are my little terriers. This kind of thing doesn't happen very often. When they jump in, some of the puppies are getting playful and they learn about it. They jump in. And when they, they jump in together, I mean, that's the kind of, that's the kind of thing that doesn't happen often. So uh, really happy that these two little Chicago puppies are in the book. They're little terriers named Pringles and Pick Me. Uh, you also notice uh, the lights behind here. You can see these lights. These are not pool lights. These are what's called off-board strobes. Any photographers in here? I'm the only guy. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's not super exciting, but I'll just kind of tell you how it goes down. So I'm using a, a dive housing now by Icolite, Icolite Underwater Systems. So it's basically a case designed for going really deep, 200 feet deep. I'm only water, underwater here about two feet or so. Um, and I'm using two strobes. They're called DS-161s. One here, one here. I can move them around. I can change the intensity of the strobe. I'm also dropping in what's called off-board strobes. They're not connected to the camera. They have a funny little device on them called an EV manual controller. It's like an eyeball. What happens is it looks for a change in ambient light. So when I drop this down at the bottom of the pool and I fire off my flashes, this flash goes off. I can drop one of those, two of those. It also creates a little catch lights in the top right of the image. That's caused by the off-board strobe. It just improves the images, I think, technically. We can see the dogs a little bit better. Um, but it's fun. Sometimes I drop none in. Sometimes I drop one, 10. Uh, it's about $1,700 a piece. So sometimes you're in the pool, you're thinking, I got about $32,000 in here. Uh, didn't have insurance on the gear, but everything's fine. Uh, but this is little Ava the beagle. Here's what she looks like now. Fun, huh? All grown up. Same markings. Yeah, I just saw this dog the other day, and I was like, wow. So I, just, I added this in here today, because they, you know, they sent me these pictures. And it's crazy. I mean, here she's about six weeks, and here she's about a year and six weeks. Kind of fun, huh? Uh, this is Corey. This is also in Tucson, and water that's about 80 degrees. I just really like how vivid this shot is, and the, the mo he looks pretty happy. Um, there were six of these little cattle dog mix puppies, all rescues in Tucson. This is another one, Zelda. This is my favorite shot in the book, and I'll tell you why. Not because it's the best, technically. It's not even underwater. It's an over-under shot. The reason why I like it, so Zelda and Corey, brother and sister, Zelda, a special needs puppy, needs some additional TLC. Um, the people that were looking after Zelda were saying, she's not ready for swimming. You know, She's not ready. She's not ready. 
And I'm just thinking, wait a minute, Zelda's allowed to be around swimming pools. She's going to be adopted by someone here in Arizona and probably live at a place where there's a swimming pool. She needs a lesson. They said, no, 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 no. That's not going to work. So Ze little Zelda here watched me, Corey, and the other four do the swim lessons for about a half hour. All of a sudden, I hear a splash. Zelda jumped in on her own, <laughs> jumped on her own, and she swam right to the exit. And it's a big pool. She swam right to the exit. I wasn't even over there, but she had watched us. And she had watched all of her little friends learn how to get out. And she learned how to get out. And that was my proudest moment during the whole book. And that's what it's all about. So this little puppy is safer for that. Um, so I had to put her in there. I mean, she didn't jump in 100 times. But she would watched and she learned. She did it on her own. And I'm like, that's what I'm talking about. <laughs> so proud. This is kind of a, another sassy shot. Monty, this is in New York City. There's a pool for dogs in the city of New York, in Manhattan, uh, called Water for Dogs. And it's mostly a hydrotherapy pool. So they're rehabilitating dogs um, from injury or you know, as a sort of recovery from surgery. Um, hydrotherapy is an incredible thing that is improving the quality of life for thousands of dogs here in the States and all around the world. And it's wonderful that uh, more and more pools are popping up. And Dogs can have a much higher quality of life and can extend their lives by years because of it. So that's what this pool is designed for. Also, apparently, it's designed for underwater puppy photo shoots. <laughs> so I went in here, have a few New York dogs. I thought this kind of looks like uh, the movie The Ring a little bit. <laughs> uh, but just real sassy. I mean, I love, with underwater dogs, you see such a, a range of emotions. This dog is sleeping right here. i got to be more entertaining. <laughs> You see such a range of emotions. I feel like dogs have a very similar range of emotions to human beings, and that's why we connect with them so much. Uh, and that's why we can also appreciate these images, because maybe in each picture we see a little bit of us, too. So I like to put that in there. Also, point about this is a hairy, hairless Chinese crested. Um, at, I think, oh, 10 weeks or 11 weeks, named Scooter. Also goes to show you, not just labs and golden retrievers like to swim. So many people say that to me. Oh, it's just labs and golden retrievers, right? I meet labs and golden retrievers all the time that don't like to swim or are not good swimmers. And it's because of whatever their history is. Now, labs and goldens, they might have more of a history in general with the water, but you'll still find labs and goldens that are not into it or that are not great swimmers because they haven't had the right experience. And then you meet these little clowns, and they're just dominating. I mean, you got to remember, too, most dog breeds, pretty much all dog breeds, they're almost exactly identical with their genetics. It's almost exact with minor differences. The history is the same. They're all coming from wolves. Um, you know, and obviously, there's some, some, a lot of different things that have happened along the way uh, over 20,000 years. But most dog breeds are fairly new, and they're all pretty much related, uh, very closely related. So the history is almost the same. So even though some of these dogs may have forgotten their connection with the water, they can remember it. Uh, and it comes back to them. All the time, I meet dogs who have never been around water or just have a fear of it. But with the right experience, and once they can turn a curiosity into confidence, they can dominate. I've met dogs who have never been swimming, and they come with me in the pool, and they dive down six feet, and they have a blast. Uh, so that happens. But I do have a poodle of my own, a little poodle mix named Nala, who you will not find uh, in the book except for in my author photo. <laughs> She's a great swimmer. She... Um, She'll get in the creek and like look around a little bit, but she doesn't have a retrieve drive, and it's just not her number one hobby. So my next book is actually uh, it's called Nala on the Couch, and it's going to be 2,000 pages. <laughs> uh, here's my little boxer. This is Prince, eight weeks old. Looks like an Olympic swimmer, I think. Excellent form. This is in Portland, Maine. These are my labs. These guys are my stars. They started swimming at six weeks of age. And these guys are being kind of prepped to be dock dogs. Anybody familiar with dock dogs? So dock dogs is a competition for dogs and their, their humans. It's all about jumping off a platform to see how far they can go into the pool and how high they can go. And it's a lot of fun. The dogs go crazy for it. I mean, it's a blast. Some of the people are kind of interesting. You know, you get the stage moms that are like, it's like, you know, they're little ballerinas or something like that, or they're little actresses. Uh, but the dogs do love it. They think it's hilarious, and it, it just, it's a very positive thing. So these guys are going to be dock dogs. At six weeks, they started swimming. By nine weeks, they would go show up at the pool and whine at the gate because they wanted to get in. That's how much they liked it. I met them at 10 weeks, 10 and a half. It was a no-brainer. They hadn't really been underwater yet, but... You know, everything was in line. So I got to work with all three of them, Reason, Grits, and Jack. You'll find all three in the book. There they are with the puppy teeth. But even at 11 weeks, they start to look a little bit older. 
but the puppy teeth, puppy teeth tell it all for sure. Here's these two. I wanted to work with all three underwater. I thought, wouldn't that be something, you know, if we could do that. But even though they live with different people, uh, they all live in Fort Myers, Florida. They each live in a, their own respective home. But they spend a lot of time together. When that happens, they're going to come across a hierarchy. Who's the boss and who's not the boss? It's going to happen. Anybody out there have two dogs or more? Yeah. I, I mean, if you have two dogs spending time together, you'll figure out who is the boss. Uh, and this guy right here can tell you that too, but that's how it goes down. And even if dogs are spending a lot of time together, they will establish a hierarchy. These puppies start to establish a hierarchy. Jack, who you don't see in this picture, is somewhere in the background looking for another toy. But he would not compete with these two. He would not go under with them. These two were still trying to duke it out. Who is the boss? You know? So they would compete with each other. And I don't know who the boss is. I'm going to see him in a couple weeks down in Florida. I'm excited to figure out who, uh, who turned out as the champ. But they were really funny. Diving down five feet to the bottom of a pool at 11 weeks. I mean, that's a shocking thing to see. And it's just like, I can't believe this is happening. But really happy they're in there. Here's a behind the scenes shot taken with a GoPro. Uh, I think a Hero 3 Black Edition. You'll just see the quality, which I think is, it's, you see the details. But you're kind of missing some of the illumination. A lot of people think I would shoot, even all these Instagram uh, GoPro accounts, they always tag my pictures. GoPro, GoPro. And I'm like, I didn't use a GoPro. <laughs> Stop doing that. Um, <laughs> So, but this is taken with a GoPro. You can kind of see the process of me underwater. I'm not, I'm in a wetsuit just because I'm in the water so much. And if you're in, any, anybody a diver out there? Yeah, you're a diver. So, I mean, if you're in water for, say if you're in 80 degree water for 10 hours, you know, we're 98.6 degrees, unless you got a fever, uh, or you're an alien. But generally, you're going to be 98.6 degrees. And if you're in the water for a long period of time, your core temperature will drop over time. And you will get hypothermia. And it affects everything. So sometimes I'm in the pool for 14 hours, even if it's 85 degrees. You'd be surprised how chilly you get without a wetsuit. So I wear a wetsuit. And I'm also working with the dogs at such close proximity where you're going to get scratched up because they're trying to say hello to you. So uh, I do wear that. But you'll see me underwater here. I'm just going under with the ball. And then here's the same moment, almost. Some of the shots with underwater puppies, you'll see tennis balls or toys, some of which you won't. Sometimes the tennis ball falls out of frame. Like here, it's in the frame, and then it's drifting down. It's sinking down below. And here's the shot. The illumination, I think, really comes into play here. You know, you couldn't have, if all the shots in the book were like this, I think it would be a little boring. Uh, the moment's cool, but it's nice to be able to see the details and the puppy teeth and everything like that. This is one of my favorite shots, though. This is not a dog. <laughs> Uh, this is a baby, actually. And I'm more of a dog guy, and then cats, and then like 100 other creatures, <laughs> and then maybe babies. And my publisher right now is going to watch this and get mad at me. But um, I've been working with babies for the last four or five months. Photographed 750 human babies underwater in all kinds of states, and especially the big four, which are California, Arizona, Texas, and Florida. I uh, did an assignment for New York, New York Times Magazine called Little Nemos, highlighting the importance of water safety for children. Uh, drowning is a number one cause of accidental death in children under five in the United States. Between 500 and 700 uh, children under five drown, mostly in swimming pools, mostly because there hasn't been proper safety measures, and also the children are not prepared for the water. Again, another serious issue that can be prevented. I thought, you know what? If I can bring my camera into this and try to tell a story and highlight uh, some awareness about the importance of water safety for children. I don't care. I'm not doing a book tour for this. I have no idea if any books are going to sell. But if we can improve um, the awareness, I think it's terrific. Even though uh, I'm not a dad, I don't know if I'll ever be a dad. But I did have an amazing time working with these little creatures <laughs> all around. And I, but I'll tell you, at the end of each photo shoot, wasn't trying to bring one of them home with me. Happy to go home and see my dog. <laughs> uh, but very inspiring to watch these babies learn such important you know, life survival lessons, and a range of intensity. Some of the programs are more basic. Some of them are very intense. But either way, very, very productive and very important. We have a lot of media lined up that's going to promote this next spring. The book will be out in April of 2015, more or less. So that's what I've been doing. Um, that's bubbles and paws. What is that? Anybody know? Who can tell me? Where's a guess? Anybody know what that is? It's a tiger. <laughs> So I have worked with some exotic creatures. Um, this guy's pretty fun. So I'm working on a project called Underwater Creatures. I may or may not make a book out of it. Uh, I'm interested in 
photographing types of animals you wouldn't necessarily see underwater, but still have a connection with the water. Whether or not I can make a book that's yet to be seen uh, with my publisher. So I'd like to, Little Brown, hey, let's get a book deal on the horizon, huh? Um, but really fascinated with bringing the message of helping other types of animals through photography. It's funny how, and shocking, just what a photograph can do these days, especially because of the internet. You know, you can bring a message with a photograph and you can touch a million people, you know, or a hundred million people, or now it's something like over a billion people have seen the underwater puppies pictures in the last three weeks. That's a lot of people. But when you can attach something that's positive about it and important, I think it goes further than, I mean, I love that the images are joyful and they make people smile, but it's cool to bring a message to it also. So I'd like to be able to highlight all kinds of animals um, other than dogs and cats and figure out how we can help them too by creating some really interesting images of them underwater. We'll find out working with wild animals in captivity or in the wild is always a hot topic. Uh, I've done it on both sides. I've worked with animals in sanctuaries to help raise money for those animals. I've also done it in the wild. I've been criticized for both. So it's a tricky world. You know, when I'm photographing dogs at the pool, nobody really questions it. But if you're in Alaska photographing a bear that happens to come up upon you and you don't see him and you take a picture, you know, some people are going to not like that. So it's tough. But my intentions are good. I would like to make the book. I think it can make um, some kind of a difference for a lot of other types of animals, too. Anybody have any questions? I have a dog that likes water, but he you know, keeps his head above the water. How do you get them to dive down like that? Sure. So it's all based on the classic game of fetch. Yep. So I basically start, uh, I show up at the photo shoot, I meet the dog, we become pals, and they have to know that I'm the cool dude that's at the pool. They get familiar with the pool. It's all about them being comfortable and trusting. We start to play fetch. We move it into the pool. I have three games I've designed based on the game of fetch for the pool. One's called bobbing for apples. The dog comes onto the stairs or the ramp. I take the tennis ball two inches under, three inches under, five inches under, and they start to put their, their nose in and then up to their eyes and then deeper. Once they figure that game out, we play swim and bob. They basically swim with me and I do the same thing. They're swimming around with me. I have the ball. We're all swimming out there and then I let the ball go. As the ball starts to sink, they go under and I dive in and I'm taking the, taking the shots with them. And then of course the diving game, I have you know, one of my most outstanding underwater dogs is a dog named Rex, a boxer. I'll, go di I'll dive down to the bottom of the pool nine feet. I'll hold his rocket toy up like this. I'll wave it at him and I'm, I'm down there. He'll see it and he'll do a full swan dive, dive all the way down, swim down at me and I'm taking the pictures as he's coming down. I hand him the rocket, he grabs the rocket. Now we're both on the floor of the pool, right? And I got my weight belt on to hold myself down there. He doesn't have a weight belt. He just dived down. This dog is like a mermaid. I mean, it's crazy. So he'll, he's looking at me now. He's got the rocket. And he's just thinking, what are you doing down here, guy? <laughs> so then he looks up. And we're deep. He looks up like this. And then he uses his hind legs. And he shoots off the bottom back up to the top again. It's the craziest thing I think I've ever seen. Uh, but the pictures are pretty cool. Yeah, I was so excited to meet this dog. I got two speeding tickets in 40 minutes driving out to Lake Havasu City. I would have went to jail. The, the second cop was like, I was like, I just got, you know, how is this happening again? And I'm like, officer, is there a problem? This is the second cop. Is there a problem? And he's like, um, you know, yeah, you're speeding. I'm like, no, there must be a mistake. I just got pulled over for speeding. <laughs> I didn't say that. He didn't know about the first ticket. I would have gone to jail for that. I mean, I'm like, listen, man, I just, there's this dog that I'm supposed to meet. He's really cool, and I'm just excited about it. And he's like, what, are, what, something wrong with you, man? <laughs> Get out of here. But, um, but it was worth it, I think. I got out there finally and did the shots. <laughs> Thanks. You seem to keep revisiting dogs. Is that because you're reshooting or just because you're checking in, hanging out with them? Um, well, dogs are my number one. Yeah. So, you mean why am I keep working? With, why do I keep working with dogs over and over again? Yeah. That's my. Or, yeah, like you seem to go back to the same. Dogs oh, visit the same dogs. Yeah, like you've seen yeah. them when they were a year and a half. Old. I have my favorites. Okay. <laughs> I have my. I mean, I always meet new dogs too. But there's some dogs like Buster I like to see from time to time, and Lulu, the Jack Russell, and Nevada, you know, the Border Collie, and I mean, I have some of my favorites, Rhoda, the Diving Dachshund. These dogs like have been such a big part of my life because they've changed my life. So. When I have an opportunity to go back and see them again, it's like the favorite thing I could ever do. You know, I mean, they're like my family. So I like to go back and swim with them and take some more pictures, and it's kind of fun. So what's the mechanics of the actual shoot? Uh, do you hold your breath for a long time? Do, 
how do you deal with your hands holding the camera, your strobes, so forth? How, sure. how does that work out? So I'm in a wetsuit. I'm holding my breath only. A lot of people would think that I'm di like a, a diver. I've actually never been diving. I'm not even certified to dive, which is embarrassing, considering how much money I have in underwater camera gear. And I love the ocean, and I love you know sea creatures. So I do plan to get certified. Um, but yeah, never been diving. Actually, if I was using dive gear, it would get in the way of what I'm trying to do. Some of the photo shoots, it's more simple. I don't have to move a whole lot. Some of the photo shoots, I mean, if you were there, I'm zipping all over the place. So I'm diving down, I'm bouncing from side to side. I'm swimming pretty fast through the water. And that would just weight me down, really. I mean, some of these dogs are fast. I've got the ball, they want it, you know, and I need to move pretty quickly. <laughs> so I can set up the right opportunity to take the picture. So I'm in a wetsuit, I'm just holding my breath, I go under. Sometimes I wear a mask, but most of the time I just open my eyes and that's about it. Um, I have my Icolite underwater housing set up with a 5D Mark III, a Canon 8 to 15 fisheye, the L lens, and I have two DS-161 strobes. I hold, my, I hold my camera usually with my right hand, and I have the tennis ball with my left hand, so I'm just shooting through the water and I'll, I'll move it forward. It weighs about 40 pounds on land. Underwater, it's not gonna weigh quite as much, but I shoot through the water, and I always use this hand for the, the tennis ball or the toy, and I use this hand to hold on to that, and I just kind of had to practice with but I'm moving fast, you know, and it's, the, and most of the images that you're gonna see in both books are taken within about 12 inches of the camera. And some of the dogs are diving in, you know, fast. So I gotta be very careful with how I'm moving that gear. Um, but if you photograph several thousand dogs and log thousands of hours in the pool, you get the hang of it though. Has any of the dogs ever uh, broken into your gear? <laughs> He knows being that, that. Being that he knows, close? He knows the answer to that. Yeah, I've lost a few, few cameras over the years. <laughs> it's all part of the fun, though. It's all part of the fun. Yeah, I've had a dog actually smash through my port, my lens port. Uh, this dog named Cowboy. And, yeah, what a rascal. But he was totally fine. He just wanted the ball, and he just went for it too far and just punched right through. Totally fine. Camera, not so much. It's amazing how fast. If you take a glass that's empty and you put it in the water, watch how fast it fills with water. <laughs> so he punched a clear hole in this thing and it's blah, 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 blah. Had another dog in, where was I? San Diego. And I was just not paying attention that close. And I'm supposed to lock on the port onto my housing. You can put these port locks on there, but it's, sometimes it's a hassle. So I basically just put it on. You twist it on. Now, if you twist it off, it'll pop off and your whole thing will flood. So this dog uh, was reaching across with his little, plaw, his little paw, and he grabbed the, the port, and he pulled it 90 degrees, just ripped the whole thing off. And that's a 5D Mark III in there. That's not a fun bill. I'm supposed to get insurance, but I haven't done that yet. <laughs> I don't think anybody would actually insure me anyway. They were like, no, forget it. Cool. All right, well, uh, if we could all please thank Seth for talking to us.